Hi, Sophie. Hi, Sin. Hi, everyone. And welcome to the Snack Covenant, episode 316. Wow. And today, we're talking about things we'd like to see in the Elden Ring DLC. I want to start with the fact that they've called this an expansion and the fact that they've said it's in development rather than coming out. Right. Right. Elden Ring's been out over a year. By this point in their life cycles, the other From games had their DLC extra areas out. Like we had Ashes of Ariandel, we had Old Hunters, we had Artorias of the Abyss. The fact that this is not even not out yet, but they've, they've just announced that they're making it. And the fact they're calling it an expansion makes me think it might be something that's a little more complicated and a little more like in depth than just being a DLC area. So it's more of an Old Hunters rather than an Ashes of Ariandel. Well, no, I think Old Hunters is a DLC area. Yeah, but it's pretty in depth. Well, what I'm thinking more along the lines of, though, is like Scholar of the First Sin. Oh, that's a whole new game, though. That's Dark Souls 2, too. Late at night, I think. What it does is it changes up the progression. It sort of remixes where a bunch of items are. And it adds in all the of the NPC. It also adds a bunch of like other NPC invaders and stuff. So it's it's not like necessarily a whole new game. It's just like a very, very it's like a very ambitious mod. Yeah, okay. Yeah, but um there's still a lot of things in Elden Ring that like feel like they could maybe have been, you know, expanded on a little bit that are in the base game. Um, the obvious one being Mikella, who we're pretty sure is the focal point of this DLC. Right, and we're pretty sure of that because Mikella is riding Torrent in the picture. Well, okay. What we see in that picture is someone who looks exactly like Mikella on Torrent. Some people have said it's not Mikella, it's a young version of Marika. It is entirely possible it will come out and it will be someone else, but as far as, like, all we have now is that's Mikella. Because Miyazaki has done a bait and switch before. For example, when the Old Hunters DLC came out, when people saw Lady Maria in the Astral Clock Tower, a lot of people were like, oh my god, that's Carol. When The Ringed City came out, when people saw the lady with the egg and the dark hair, people were like, oh my god, that's Velka. Yeah. yeah. So it's quite possible it's going to be like, oh my god, this is actually like Radagon or something. It's Radagon before the die job. It's exactly back when he was peroxiding his hair to try <laughs> yes. to hide, and he's like, "It's not working. I have to fuse with someone." <laughs> uh, so I'm sort of coming at it from the perspective that, like, it's likely to be more than just an area. It might actually be a little bit more of an overhaul, right? Which they've kind of already done. Like, there was that patch that came out that added the coliseums. Now the coliseums are already there; they just weren't finished. So, like, I'm wondering if it'll be something like that. Like, it'll just sort of remix parts of the overworld. And it'll, like, you know, maybe move some enemies around. Um, might, like, open up some places we couldn't get to before. I don't know. I've broken this up into a bunch of, like, little sections about what I'd like to see in each part. So I just want to start with the story, because I think it's why most people are listening to us in the first place. So something that I sort of speculated about in the initial, like, launch sort of image stream that I did. And a lot of people I know have said similar things. Is that like it looks like it's Mikola going into what they call the deathbed dream. So the deathbed dream is like a state that Godwin is in. You only encounter it once, but basically you go inside of Godwin's dreams while he's dead. And inside that there's like fragments of his past, which is takes the form of uh, Lich Dragon Fortisax. And since Mikola and St. Trina are, like, they're kind of connected characters. Um, initially, like, they literally were the same character. It's been moved around a bit. We'll talk about that later on. But, yeah, the idea of, like, Mikola going inside Godwin's dream sort of makes sense to me for a number of reasons. Um, most like that the area that you see is, like, that doesn't look like Mikola's dream. It's very desolate. There's gravestones everywhere. There's this massive, like, dead sort of hunk of rotting wood that is encircling the Erd tree which is like not what you would expect from Mikola that looks like, and also the fact that Mikola is riding into it. It's almost like Mikola is heading toward that thing to try to like save Godwin. 
Something I want to bring up now, because I didn't bring it up during the initial stream, because we literally didn't know it was happening and I had no notes, um, is that there's a very interesting little ghost NPC in Castle Soul, and he mentions Mikola. And he says, when you talk to him, he says, Lord Mikola, forgive me, the sun has not been swallowed. Our prayers are lacking and your comrade remains soulless. So he's talking there about the the soulless demigods that are in those big, like, turtle mausoleums. So he's making a connection between Mikola and them, and the idea that, like, Mikola is apparently trying to, like, redeem them, because it says your comrade remains soulless. And if you remember, like, the whole deal with Godwin is Godwin dies in soul but not body, and that seems to have sort of traveled down the line and infected the other demigods. So you get, like, the the one, the Lenin ones that you keep bringing up. <laughs> Where they're like, they're they're lying in state, they have no head, Mm -hmm. and they have no soul. So Mikola, what it's doing is it's connecting Mikola to them. And I think that's probably significant that it's one of the little ghost guys. Because a lot of those little ghost guys, if you look at like comparisons between like early release versions of the version we have, little ghost guys were added like later on. That's why they're little ghost guys. It's why they're not functional NPCs. Because basically, like, it's just, it's basically like the epitaph system that they cut from Dark Souls 3, where it's like, here's a little thing you can read, but we're doing it in the form of these ghost people. Now, we know that there was a very, very involved, fleshed out Michaela slash Centrina questline, complete with its own ending. Like, it had, there was a Michaela ending. And this was, like, not 100% finished, but it seems to be about 95% finished. There's, like, these NPCs that had this dialogue about it that you don't meet them anymore. There was a whole quest line where you had to use sleep sleep skills to put people to sleep, and then you, like, extracted stuff from them while they slept. And that would lead to, like, Mikola ushering in a thing called the Age of Abundance. And then that got ripped out and replaced with the Mikola is in an egg being held captive by Mog thing. Now, something that people said when I mentioned this the first time is they said, well, if they cut the Mikola stuff, they probably cut it because they didn't like it. Like, it was cut for a reason it wasn't working. But it's important to remember in the case of, like, these games specifically that pretty much every DLC for one of these games is something that was cut from the base game and then expanded on later on. Like, um, Artorias is something that was cut from Dark Souls 1. The whole concept of, like, going back in time and, like, meeting Knight Artorius and, like, Calamite being there and Chester being there. That was all partially finished for Dark Souls 1, and then they moved it to a DLC. The Old Hunters. Quite a bit of Old Hunters. Like, the Clock Tower, the Patience with the Huge Brains, um, the character that the doll was based on, the Cos character, like, that sort of, that's all stuff that was in the base game and got moved. And then, you know, like, I'm absolutely certain that if, if Demon Souls had been made under similar circumstances, we would have gotten the Northern Limit. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, like, nine months later, we've gotten Northern Limit DLC. So, like, that's kind of important to keep in mind that, like, when things in these games sort of seem to get abruptly cut, they tend to get either, like, just partially recycled or just finished and released later on. So I am wondering if, like, the sudden removal of Mikola and the sudden addition of, like, a little ghost man who mentions Mikola is sort of them hinting at, like, you know, like putting a little pin in, like, this is what we're going to do later on and we want to have some kind of connective tissue there. So I am wondering if, like, it is going to be Mikola in the deathbed dreams. Perhaps like the Deathbed Dream of Goblin, but also the other demigods trying to kind of reunite their souls with their bodies. Because that's what the spirit seems to be implying. Like this this eclipse thing. Um, by the way, I searched Zuli's little text dump and the word eclipse shows up like three times in the script. Like it's not a very well developed concept. But like the notion of this like eclipse that when it happens, like it's doing something that it mentions the eclipse is keeping at bay destined death, which is what killed Godwin. So there's something about this eclipse and its connection to the soulless demigods and its connection to Goblin and its connection to Mikola that all seems to really vibe with like the very small amount that we've seen. So I'm assuming it's going to be something like that and I would really like to see that. Um, Other reason I'd like to see it is like you mentioned Old Hunters before. If this is inside of a dream, then that gives them carte blanche to basically just shove all kinds of things in there that don't need to be, like, don't need to have a physical reason to be there. Which means, yeah, we can include things like Young Marika could be in there. 
You don't know that. But something I'm specifically interested in is, like, if it's Mikola and Godwin in a dream, I would really like to meet Godwin. Yeah. Because Godwin is a character who's very, very important to the story in the sense that, like, his death is sort of the catalyst for what kicks everything off. He also seems to have been, like, one of the most important people in the entirety of the lands between After America. Granted, a lot of this is us assuming various statues in the game are Godwin. There's something about the fact that, like, he's that important, but we never really interact with him. Um, obviously, like, his corpse is there, but I would really like to meet Godwin, um, maybe in the same way that, like, you meet Vendrick in Dark Souls 2. And the other reason I would really like Godwin there is to just build up a sense of, like, a relationship between the siblings. Because the only siblings that we really get a sense of, like, actually being siblings in the game are Mikola and Melania. Because, like, they work together, they're very concerned for each other. We know that Mikola was very close to Godwin because there's that statue that's clearly Godwin. Of, like, you know, Godwin as the older brother, like, sheltering the two of them. And that's, like, that's a relationship that you see in a statue and you read about Mikola's concern for Godwin. Um, and his desire to have Godwin die a true death. But you don't see it acted out. Like, you just hear about it. And I feel like if they're going to do a dream, it would just be really nice to get a sense that, like, there was a little family unit going. Yeah. Yeah. Um, That's true of the other ones as well. Like, the only real sense you get that, like, Rani, Rikard, and Radan are related is that you're told. Their names. Ra, ra, ra. Yeah, but it's like... Rani gave the blasphemous claw to Rikard. That's kind of it. Like, you don't really get a sense of them, like, actually being a family, whereas you kind of get a sense that, like, Godwin, Melania, and Nicola were, like, kind of close. Mm-hmm. So I'd like to see more of that. And again, I think, like, mentioning Nicola's sword, it's called the Golden Epitaph. And it's basically, if you look at the epitaph, it's Nicola saying, like, brother, one day you will die a true death. So I think that might actually kind of be the plot of the DLC, is it's like, it's Nicola trying to reunite Godwin's body with Godwin's soul so that Godwin can die properly. Except, looking at it that way would also kind of mean that, like, for those who live in death, part of the plot would need to go in a different direction. Like, it kind of complicates things, because... Godwin becoming, like, the first demigod to die and developing this weird relationship with the people who were half alive and half dead. Like, there's something in that that would maybe, if you, like, fixed the way death worked, which is sort of what Piccolo seems to be trying to do, you would fundamentally alter how that worked, which might actually, like, if you took it logically, might lock you out of an ending. But um, what I'm actually wondering if, like, we're going back to, like, okay, if this is in a dream. So... It may actually just lead to us, like, if we just got an extra rune, like an extra mending rune at the end of it, and then you could choose what to do with it. So you could get the Age of the Duskborn, or you could, like, put Godwin's soul back and get another another ending. Like, there's all sorts of different ways it can go. Um, the other thing I was thinking of in terms of, like, a story would be something to do with the Glomide Queen. Mm-hmm. Because she is very intimately connected with death and depending on how you read it could have been godwin's sister the glow my queen is like quite a complicated subject and she she makes a hash of the timeline because it sort of implies that like marika removed death and gave it to the glow my queen who then had it stolen and went back again and then malekith had it and it becomes this weird game of hot potato and i'm not 100 percent sure exactly how that's supposed to have worked but like I do wonder, like, this is this is not, like, a theory real I've come up with this thing. I do <laughs> legitimately wonder if the Glomide Queen slash Melina was Godwin's sister. And the reason she's called the Glomide Queen is it's like the Nameless King, where they didn't want to name her. Like, they struck her from history because of what she did. Mm. The whole thing about the Glomide Queen is, like, again, the timeline is a little confusing. She's sort of all over the place. Um, but I do wonder if, like, she was contemporaneous with Godwin. Like, they call her an Empyrean at one point. So I'm wondering if, like, she was... Because there's this obsession with, like, twinning in Elden Ring. So I'm wondering if, like, was she Godwin's twin sister? 
And, like, Godwin was sort of, like, they were the Mikula and Melania of their time. And, like, Godwin sort of had, like, was, like, the golden one that, like, gave life to everything. And then his sister was, like, the one that embodied death. And then because of what the Glomide Queen did, she was, like, struck from history. I want, like, just some sort of concrete info on the Glomide Queen because she's clearly massively important. And she's not, like, just a weird thing that's off to the side. Like, she's Melina. And unless they do a sequel about Melina, like, this, I think, needs a little more, like, just clarification of exactly what's going on. So that was pretty much what I wanted from, like, the story. Um, you could maybe get some clarification on the whole Marika Radigan fusion. That makes a lot more sense to me than Glomide Queen's timeline. But, like, the Marika Radigan fusion, it would just be nice to get it, like, in plain, well, plain Japanese translated into plain English. But just, like... <laughs> Why, hello there. Hidetaka Miyazaki here. I was just enjoying working with Bandai Namco when Sin asked me to clarify something. While it's true that I am technically of a Japanese descent, I mostly operate out of my homeland of New Jersey. Also, just to finally clarify the ongoing argument about the scripts, they are written in English first, by me, and then they're rewritten to sound uh, like some fucking theater kid. Uh, for example, uh, Dura in Bloodborne, after he kills you, he says, uh, Next time you dream, give some thought. I don't know what that even fucking means. In uh, Japanese, that was... Deareba, ah, soko de yoku. Kangai naosu, koto dana. Both of which are mistranslations of my original line. You better stop with your shit or else I'll make your ass come out of your ears. Back to the podcast. Then I started looking at, like, you know, what I just like outside of the story, just for, like, the world. I would like to see the death sorceries from Fear, just like, I'd like more of those. Uh, which would fit with this being, like, a death-themed expansion. I would like there to be more perfume arts and more perfume items, because because the perfume stuff that we get in the game, like, it's pretty good, but there's this thing called the Perfumer's Talisman that's like, this will strengthen perfume arts, but it actually only strengthens one, because there's only one perfume art in the game that has a direct like physical damage attack, which is the spark aromatic. So you, you're burning an entire talisman slot for one thing, which like I understand if you were min-maxing, because a lot of min-max people do use perfume arts. But um, just having some more like direct damage perfumes would be nice. So it's not all just spark aromatic, spark aromatic, spark aromatic. The other thing that's weird about the perfume arts is that that talisman will buff the perfume bolts, which are these explosive bolts. You can't craft them. There's three three i think three or four perfumer cookbooks in the game none of them like you craft perfume bolts and that's so bizarre to me because you can buy the regular exploding bolts from the merchant in gelmia and i don't know why you can't either buy or craft the perfume ones but i would just like just add a perfume cookbook that gives us like the perfume bolts and like a couple more of the perfumes so on the subject of perfume, I kind of want to talk about like the crafting system and one of the problems I have with it, which is that all the like the ingredients you find, like the um, the flowers and the leaves and things like that, they have two ways of spawning. They it's a binary. Either they spawn every single time or they spawn once, which means that like say like. Going back to perfume, if, like me, you are trying to make a bunch of the poison spray mist perfume, all you're doing is going to a side of grace at the Shaded Castle, resting, running, just collecting all of the poison bloom, running back, resting, collecting the poison bloom, running back, resting. And that's, like, incredibly tedious, but it also, it's like nothing. Like, these may as well be free, because they're just constantly respawning. But then on the other end of the spectrum, you have stuff like Arteria Leaf, where there's a limited number in the game. So you get them once and you can never get them again. They will drop like, I think Arteria Leaf has like a 10% percent 
drop chance from like some incredibly strong enemy and that's it. The crafting items are either you have an effectively unlimited supply available right away to the point where I don't even know why they're bothering keeping track of them because you can just get them whenever. Or there's so few of them that you almost feel like you don't want to use them. So what I would like, um, I brought this up in one of our co-op streams that like I like the idea of a farming system. So I don't expect them to actually be able to patch in a functional farming system to Elden Ring. That would be ridiculous. <laughs> what I would like is I'd like them to just add like a couple of little quests or something that when you did them, they made more of those little crafting things spawn. Like you had to unlock them because like going back to Poison Bloom, like Poison Bloom is just everywhere in Shaded Castle. So once you've got to Shaded Castle, you effectively have infinite Poison Bloom. But I'm thinking like, it would be cool if like there was an NPC and they were like obsessed with poison and you did stuff for them. And then when you completed their quest, it just made that Poison Bloom infinitely spawn where that character was. So you had to kind of commit and go through something and it would just feel like you've like accomplished something. Mm -hmm. Another thing I'd like to see just in terms of gameplay is like some more things to do with Torrent. Because we see Torrent or like something like Torrent in that image. Did you ever try healing Torrent when you played it? No. No, I didn't either. Um, I have literally only ever healed Torrent to just see what it, like, because I was bored. (laughs) There's very little need to heal Torrent, I find, in the game, because basically if Torrent dies, you just use a Flask of Tears and Torrent comes back. And the only places that, like, healing is really at a premium would be a boss fight where you probably can't use Torrent anyway, the exception being Fire Giant. So I'm thinking, like, it would be nice if there were things that we could just do for Torrent to sort of increase our connection to him so he wasn't just, like, a means of transportation. I'm thinking, like, maybe if you could craft, say something that made torrent faster like little like like you gave him coffee beans or something and he went faster maybe like something you could craft for torrent that would give you like bonus damage on horseback and something i'd actually really like and i I brought this up when i was playing like blind the first time is that there's quite a lot of fights where i feel like torrent is a liability because torrent doesn't have iframes particularly fire giant where like fire giant is someone you fight on torrent but he's sending out these massive like waves of snow that if you were on foot you could roll through but you're on torrent so you can't and i feel like some sort of like extra kind of raisin i don't know what you like a bloodhound raisin or something if you gave that to torrent And then, like, there was a limited amount of time where, like, when you dashed with Torrent, you got a little bit of an iframe. Um, That would make some of the bosses that you fight on Torrent, just Torrent in general, like, on um, when you're traversing, like, areas, that would make him a lot more useful. And I just feel like being able to, like, make little buffs for Torrent, that would just be really good. Yeah. Yeah. um, Also, like, I was thinking... It's a little Skyrim. They probably wouldn't do it. But (laughs) if we're going to be able to, like, modify our clothes at Sites of Grace, it would be nice if you could modify Torrent's saddle. Yeah. Get little things to stick on Torrent. I wish you could ride Torrent with your friends when you're in multiplayer. See, like, I would like that too, but I sort of feel like that sounds like it's way too fundamental of, like, something to fix in an expansion. It feels like something they would fix in a sequel. Oh, yeah. Because I'm pretty sure, like, I'm sure they wanted you to be able to ride Torrent with your friends. But I think just because of the way that the world is structured, it just didn't work. Other things, just like in general, I'd like them to rework fall damage. Why? Because basically Elden Ring has two kinds of fall damage. One of which is you fall and nothing happens and the other one is that you fall and die instantly and in the middle there's a tiny tiny little space that's like you take damage like it's it's very inconsistent and i find that either you you take no damage or you die instantly which makes the cat item useless i feel like it's cool it's kind of like russian roulette you never know what you're gonna get okay that's fair that's (laughs) fair and like two things i would like in terms of like bosses in general is firstly, um, I would like less input reading. There are encounters in the game, I'm specifically thinking of Old Knight Istvan, where, like, very, very blatantly, they are reacting the second you press the button. 
I don't think those bosses are too hard, but there's just something very annoying about the fact that, like, I don't feel like I'm dueling a person. I feel like I'm trying to, like, <laughs> I'm trying yeah. to trick an AI. Yeah, it's not a great feeling. Um, the other thing I would like, and I think a lot of people probably agree with this, because it was one of the major criticisms of the game, I would like just fewer bosses in this, but I'd like them to be unique. You fight the same boss or versions of the same boss so many times that it sort of loses its impact. Yeah. Neither of us are gameplay people, really. We're definitely not no. PvP people. No. So um, I didn't have many things to say there. And then I've just got, like, a bunch of just, like, weird little things I would like to see more of in the world. Because, um, like we were saying before, Elden Ring is something where, like, this very complex world has been built, and then we're just playing through a little part of it. I would like to see more of the cipher weapons and the coded weapons, because there's only two in the game right now. Um, those are, there's the coded sword and the cipher part up, and they're weapons that are literally made out of words. It's this, like, runic script that sort of shoots out like a lightsaber. And it's the same runic script that you see that's sealing various, like, doors in the game that's presumably put there by the two fingers. Although once it's put there by Morgoth. But basically, like, I like the idea of, like, just the greater will is so weird that the vassals of the greater will have words that physically exist as, like, glowing, like, letters and runes that can hurt people. The other thing that I'm really interested in in just the world is, you know, the ruins that stick out from the sides of, the, like, the coast? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Those really interest me because it seems like they go all of the way inside. Like, it's not like... When you first see them, you might think, oh, this is, like, you know, the ruins of a city and, like, it's eroded and it's collapsed and there's, like, some rock on it. But when you explore, like, ruin-strewn precipice, you see that those ruins... They go all the way inside the mountains. So it's actually more like the mountains have formed over the top of an existing artificial structure. I wonder how much of the lands between is actually, like, artificial. Like, it almost seems like, given the amount of meteorite bullshit going on in this story, that, like, the surface of the lands between was actually just a bunch of artificial structures, and then over time, so many meteorites hit it that it developed this, like, outer coating of rock. Mm -hmm. And, like, maybe if you, like, obviously going down really deep gets you to, like, the rivers, which are, like, a distinct thing, but the top part of the lands between... Like, that almost seems like it was, like, just a huge, like, temple or something. And just so many things have hit it that it's become partially buried. But, like, that stuff is really interesting. And the other thing that's really interesting about it is that I don't know what it was for. Like, you can look at, like, the Eternal Cities and you can be like, okay, I roughly get what this place is supposed to be. It's like, here is a church. Um, you know, here is, like, uh, a place where people would go to, like, worship. Um, here's a place where people hunted. He is like a forest um, and it's all been partially destroyed over time with like erosion and things collapsing and meteorites hitting it. But the ruins in the sides of the, the cliffs and the coast, I don't know what they were for. Like, it just seems like this weird, like labyrinth that just keeps going on and on and on. And I'm not sure where it went. And on the subject of that, I also would like to see, more of the demi-humans. Mm -hmm. We see quite a lot of them, but we don't really get a sense of where they're from. Like, um, it's hinted at with the bat ladies, because they have these very ornate, like, golden necklaces on. So I think it's fair to say that, like, the, the demi-humans either were the original inhabitants of those ruins, or they came from Farum Azula. And I would maybe assume they were from Farum Azula if there were any in Farum Azula, but there aren't. So I would like to learn more about them. I would like also more of the Onyx Lords, because again, they seem like they're very, very important. They're outright said to have come from space. But the problem is, like, we've brought this up before, but the Onyx Lords just walk around in their underwear. Yeah. And I would really like to get a sense of, like, what their civilization was like. Like, are they the ones who built the ruins? 
are they the ones who like you find them in the eternal cities you find them in a bunch of like places you find them in caria a lot it's actually very very heavily implied that the carians are descended from the onyx lords so i just like to just get a like just more about the onyx lords like that these these like they look like um very sort of like tolkien sort of elf people like they're very very like lean with the pointed ears and everything and it talks about them having this mastery over gravity and being able to like move things around but at the same time you don't get a sense of what their culture was like because like i said they just wander around in their underpants Mm -hmm. so i just would really like you know just to learn some more about the onyx lords like why are they there what are they doing right so that is pretty much all I have to say about what I want from the DLC, but I spoke to some some of our friends about this before, uh, people who are like big Elden Ring fans. I just wanted to say, like, hey, what would you like to see? So I started talking to our friend AWOL. Um, AWOL actually just agreed with me about the Eclipse stuff. Um, she said she wanted to see more of the Eclipse, and since that was pretty much what I wanted to see as well... Um, yeah, like we're, we're sort of on the same page there about the Eclipse. I spoke to Asa. Asa wants to see the Formless Mother, the blood god that Mog is worshipping. Mm-hmm. I think that could actually kind of fit in because Mog's the one that has Mikola. Uh, he also said he wants you to be able to adopt a cat. Oh, that's very mm. Asa. Yeah, yeah. Um, Allison, uh, she just said easier bosses. <laughs> Her favourite part of the game is Limgrave and Lyonia because they're scaled low enough that you can just sort of wander around and explore and not worry about being pancaked by something. And I think, like, that's probably, like, I'd want that as well. Um, mm-hmm. Again, something a lot of people bring up is, like, the balancing in Elden Ring is kind of all over the place. Like, there's a sudden leap in terms of, like, enemy damage and defense when you hit Altus. And if you're not prepared for it, it feels like you've done something wrong. Or it can feel insurmountable. So yeah, I, I am hoping like the DLC doesn't give us like, I mean, I know it will, but I'm hoping we don't get like in just being constantly squished by things as you're trying to explore. Because I feel like people just really like the setting and I would just like to be able to explore the setting without without worrying. And uh, Alistair, who we've had on a couple of times, he wants to find out more about the timeline. And uh, Alistair also says that he would like them to add like just whole new regions of the overworld with like a whole new like like land mass like something that's like the size of limgrave and just like make that somewhere that presumably you just warp to it from like one of those little warp gates mm-hmm. yeah okay sin you've heard what i think uh you've heard what a bunch of elden ring experts think what would you want to see from this dlc in this dlc i would like to cosplay as iron fist alexander mm-hmm. ride a dragon mm-hmm and have a new weapon called the Dying Will Bullet. Sophie, do the outro. That was The Snack Covenant, episode 316. What we want in the Elden Ring DLC slash expansion. So if people are interested in expansion, where should they go? They should go to Amazon Prime and watch The Expanse. I didn't see it. My boyfriend is obsessed with it. He was watching it, right? Every single day of our freaking lives. He was watching The Expanse. And then he bought The Expanse books. And he didn't even touch them. And those are expensive. They're like hard. I like how you barely said anything in this whole episode. (laughs) And it's like, you know what really grinds my gears? What makes my... What drives my blood? The Expanse. (laughs) I'm sure it's good. Like I said, I didn't watch it. My boyfriend did. <laughs> Thank you, Sophie. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, cultists. And thank you, everyone, for listening. And see you all next time. Bye. Bye.